Coming to you live from Angkasapuri, I'm Rene Fong and this is Updates at Noon. Making the headlines today, Food Bank Siswa Program benefits over 21,000 students nationwide. Police combat drug-laced vape liquid sales activities. Over 21,000 students from 28 institutions of higher learning, IPTs nationwide, have benefited from the Food Bank SISWA program as of September. Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs Minister Dato Sri Alexander Nantalingi said the program spread its wings with its launch at University Technology Mara UITM Sarawak branch yesterday, which is the 29th IPT to enjoy the benefits of this initiative. In a statement, the minister said the student food bank at the UITM Sarawak branch has so far benefited 831 B40 students from various fields, in addition to successfully instilling the spirit of volunteerism in charity work. He said the food bank SISWA program managed by the Malaysia Food Bank Secretariat, Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, KPDN HEP, has been activated since February 2019, with aid also channeled to the needy including selected B40 and victims of natural disasters like floods. Meanwhile, he said the ministry had also implemented the Retort Packaging Technology Initiative involving the hotel and catering industry and agriculture-based food producers. So far, 12 Retort machines have been operating in 10 selected locations and have produced over 3,000 food packs to be distributed to the targeted groups that have been identified. Uzbekistan Airways has resumed its flights from Tashkent to Kuala Lumpur after a two-year hiatus with the first flight using A321neo aircraft landing at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport yesterday. The aircraft carrying 188 passengers was greeted with a traditional water arch as it made its way to the arrival gate. The Uzbekistan Embassy in Malaysia said the resumption of flights from Uzbekistan to Malaysia and vice versa by Uzbekistan Airways spurs the tourism growth of both countries. We have uh, three categories, I would say. So, uh, tourists, yes. Uh, the second category, uh, students starting here. And the third category, family members. I would like to have it daily. But it's it's up to the up to the air, air, airways to decide. So if the if there is a great demand, uh, I, I hope that we'll have a daily flight. Ini akan buka ruang kepada lebih banyak laluan laluan penerbangan baru, khususnya melalui daripada Central Asia. Dan kita juga mengharapkan sambutan yang baik daripada dua-dua pihak, daripada pelancong pelancong daripada Uzbek dan juga of course saya tidak menafikan pelancong dari Malaysia. Uh, Uzbek Airlines akan meningkatkan lagi frekuensi penerbangan mereka. For many years, flights between the two countries have served the development and exchange of experience in the field of economy, education, medicine, technology, tourism and many other areas. Beginning yesterday, flights Tashkent Kuala Lumpur, Tashkent will be operated twice a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays with the duration of the flight slightly more than seven hours. The Royal Malaysia Police PDRM has confirmed that there are activities of selling drug-laced vape liquids openly. PDRM Secretary Dato Nur Syah Muhammad Saadudin said actions to combat such activities have been and are being taken by the police. 
In a statement, Datuk Nur Siah said actions included the successful busting of a drug trafficking syndicate distributing and processing drugs in the form of vape liquids around the Klang Valley last month. The operation included the seizure of drugs and property worth 3.47 million ringgit and the arrest of seven suspects. She further noticed that PDRM is serious in eradicating all activities involving the distribution and abuse of drugs and stern action will be imposed on any party involved. Yesterday, local media reported that drug-laced vape liquids are widely sold online and openly marketed to consumers. Incumbent Jeli MP Datuk Sri Mustafa Muhammad announced that he will not be defending the Jeli parliamentary seat in the 15th general election, GE15. Datuk Sri Mustafa, who is also minister in the Prime Minister's Department Economy, said his decision to not contest the seat has been communicated to Perikatan Nasional PN Chairman Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, who is also Bursatu President. According to Datuk Sri Mustafa, the decision was made after taking into account his doctor's advice that his health status will not allow him to continue serving as an effective representative of the people. He expressed his gratitude to the people in Jeli who have always given support and cooperation to him in executing the socio-economic development agenda in the Jeli constituency since 1995. He also expressed his deepest gratitude to his friends in the cabinet. Datuk Sri Mustafa, contesting on Barisan Nasional BN ticket, won the Jeli parliamentary seat since 1995 and defended the seat for five terms, except for 1999 to 2004, when he lost to past candidate Muhammad Apandi Muhammad. In the GE14, Datuk Sri Mustafa won Jeli with a majority of 6,647 votes, defeating past and PKR candidates. Kairi Jamaluddin, who regards himself as the underdog, however, wants to accomplish an impossible mission by winning the Sungai Buloh parliamentary seat during the GE15. Kairi, who would be launching a special manifesto next week, reminded the party machinery, including himself, to run the campaign in a gentleman and civilised manner. His Barisan Nasional BN will parade five new faces for state seats in the coming GE15. Announcement of the names of the candidates was made by Perlis BN Chairman Datuk Sri Azlan Man last night. The five new faces are Saiful Daniel Muhammad Yusuf for Sena, Lim Wen Ki Indra Kayangan, Kamarudin Malik Kuala Perlis, Syed Atif Syed Abu Bakar Pauh, and Sarifuddin Ahmad Sanglang. Calon-calon uh, ini telah pun melepasi saringan-saringan uh, yang telah pun dibuat dengan begitu teliti oleh pihak ibu pejabat. Dan mereka ini adalah merupakan calon-calon yang memenuhi syarat yang ketatkan itu wali, uh, winability, uh, acceptability dan likability. Jadi insyaAllah lah mereka-mereka uh, ini semuanya kita yakin uh, akan mendapat sokongan uh, daripada rakyat dan insyaAllah. Datuk Sri Azlan Man said the change in norm evolves around the party's strategic direction without disrupting the agenda of the party in the state. During the GE14, BN won the Padang Besar and Arau parliamentary seats as well as 10 state seats, while PKR 3 and PAS 2. Philippine regions under state of calamity. That and more coming up right after this short break. Why do we tell you stories? Relevant. New. Efficient. Accurate. Reliable. 
we bring you extraordinary stories from around the world, from politicians, bankers, and even your favorite celebrities. This and many more on RTM's English News. You're back with me, Rene Fong. Philippine President Ferdinand Ramualdez Marcos yesterday placed four regions of the Southeast Asian country under a state of calamity due to the severe tropical storm Nalge. Marcos signed the document to put Calabazon, the Bicol region, Western Visayas, and the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao after a six month state of calamity, where more than 1.4 million people were adversely affected by Nago over the weekend. Marco said the state of calamity declaration will hasten the government and private sector's rescue, recovery, relief and rehabilitation efforts and help effectively control the prices of basic necessities and prime commodities. Nalge, one of most destructive cyclones that battered the Philippines, triggered flash floods and landslides in many parts of the country. The government has tallied at least 132 deaths as of Monday. Marcos also stressed he might include other areas in the declaration of a state of calamity if warranted, taking into consideration the continuing damage assessment in affected areas and based on the recommendation of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. Nalge is the 16th tropical cyclone to lash the Philippines this year. It slammed into Catanduans in island province in the Bicol region before dawn on Saturday. The death of an Aboriginal teenager in Western Australia ignited nationwide rallies and vigils with activists saying the country continues to fail its Indigenous people and is sleeping with racism. Cassius Turvey, 15, was allegedly attacked with a metal pole by a white man in the western city of Perth on 13th October, dying from his injuries 10 days later. The attack, which was described as racially motivated by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, has been met with widespread revulsion. Thousands of people gathered in cities around Australia, including Perth, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. A 21-year-old man has been charged with Tuve's murder and will appear in court next month. The man also faces charges of aggravated assault and stealing after he allegedly attacked Tuve's 13-year-old friend with a pole and took his crutches. Russia would renew its participation in an agreement allowing Ukraine to export grain via the Black Sea just four days after suspending its role in the deal. Moscow had pulled out at the weekend, saying it could not guarantee the safety of civilian ships crossing the Black Sea because of a drone attack on its fleet there. The U-turn followed a phone call between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan on Tuesday and after consultations between the defence ministers. In a statement, Russia's defence ministry said that thanks to the involvement of the United Nations and Turkey, it had been possible to obtain written guarantees from Ukraine that it would not use the humanitarian corridor or Ukrainian ports to conduct military operations against Russia. Kiev has not claimed responsibility for the attack and denies using the grain program security corridor for military purposes. Britain has denied involvement and accused Russia of trying to divert attention from its military failures in Ukraine. Germany has signed off on an energy price cap, the cornerstone of a massive 200 billion euro package to shield households and businesses from rising costs. German Chancellor Olaf Scholl said the support package was Germany's response so that citizens do not have to fear their bills. Germany's businesses have also been crying out for help at a time when Europe's largest economy is drifting towards recession and inflation has shot past 10 percent. We have also here a deckling. I have to correct myself. By the gas prices, it was 12 cents. By the petrol prices, it is the 40 cents I just mentioned. 
The plan will see the price for a percentage of household and businesses' typical consumption capped at lower than market prices. For gas, 25,000 larger businesses as well as almost 2,000 hospitals and schools will benefit from the cap as soon as 1st January next year, according to the plan agreed between the federal government and regional leaders. Households and smaller businesses, meanwhile, could have to wait until 1st March at the latest for the price break to come into force, while the cap for smaller consumers will only come into force later. The government will pick up their heating bills in December. A similar price cap will also apply to electricity from the start of the new year in January, with the measures set to last through to the end of April 2024. Civilians attacked a United Nations peacekeeping convoy in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, injuring two people. The UN mission said the convoy was attacked when it stopped at an army checkpoint near an internally displaced person site in Kanya Rudshinya, eight kilometers from the city of Goma. It said a crowd assembled and threw stones at the convoy, setting fire to at least one truck. The UN peacekeepers then fired warning shots into the air and finally left the zone. Frustration has grown in the region this year with a UN mission, which civilians accuse of failing to protect them from worsening militia violence. Early on Tuesday, the UN announced a strategic and tactical withdrawal of 450 peacekeepers from Rumangabo, located further north near Virunga Park. The Ethiopian government and regional forces from Tigray agreed to cease hostilities, a dramatic diplomatic breakthrough two years into a war that has killed thousands, displaced millions and left hundreds of thousands facing famine. Just over a week after formal peace talks mediated by the African Union AU began in the South African capital Pretoria, delegates from both sides signed an agreement described by an AU official as a permanent cessation of hostilities. The implementation of the peace agreement would be supervised and monitored by a high-level AU panel. Troops from Eritrea, a separate country which borders Tigray, as well as forces from other Ethiopian regions have taken part in the conflict on the side of the Ethiopian army. Neither Eritrea nor the regional forces participated in the talks in South Africa and there was no mention at yesterday's ceremony of whether they would abide by the truce. The war stems from a catastrophic breakdown in relations between the Tigray People's Liberation Front TPLF, a guerrilla movement turned political party which dominated Ethiopia for 27 years, and Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who was once part of their ruling coalition but whose appointment in 2018 ended the TPLF's dominance. Implementation of the peace agreement. Next in sports, Real Madrid seal UCL Group top spot with Celtic dropping. Stay with us. Malaysia faced a tough task to make the final of the 29th edition of the Sultan Aslan Shah Cup hockey tournament after drawing 1-1 with Pakistan for their first point last night. The Speedy Tigers, coached by A. Arul Selvaraj, lost their opening round-robin game against South Korea 3-0 and prop up the standings with just one point from two matches. World number 10 Malaysia began today's match against world number 18 Pakistan in fine fashion when they shot ahead through a field goal by forward Shello Silverius in the 26th minute. Although the hosts played way better compared to yesterday's capitulation at the hands of world number 12 South Korea, their failure to convert any of the five penalty corners could very well come back to haunt them. National goalkeeper Hafiz Zudin Othman deserves praise for thwarting five Pakistan penalty corner attempts. However, even he could not prevent Pakistan from getting the equaliser through Abbas Ahmad's 37th minute penalty corner goal. We got five penalty corners, that's score Lang Song. Well, Pakistan won five, but they scored one and uh, we, we missed a couple of chances. So again, um, 
but definitely has huge, huge, huge comeback in terms of energy, then you get smangat. Uh, we just need to be more clinical in the circle. The Speedy Tigers will take a break today before taking on South Africa in their third match tomorrow. In other matches today, World No. 20 Egypt defeated World No. 14 South Africa 3-0, while South Korea edged World No. 17 Japan 1-0. National men's doubles ace Aaron Chia has pledged to make amends for a poor French Open outing last week by bouncing back at the BWF World Tour Finals in Guangzhou, China in December. The Malacca shuttler admitted that his mind was disturbed and he lost focus when he and his partner So Wei Yi crashed out in the first round in Paris. Saya mungkin hari itu agak mungkin fokus kurang masa tu lepas sebab lepas demak kita kalah dengan uh, Kevin Gideon so ada macam uh, effect lah dekat sana sebab masih fikir match dekat sana so tapi kita akan uh, bangkit lagi dekat World Tour Final nanti ya yeah. Aaron was met after receiving a 70,000 ringgit incentive from the Malacca government at the ceremony to hand over incentives for the World Badminton Championships, Commonwealth Games and Malaysia Games Sukma 2022. The incentives were for his achievement in emerging as champions with Woi Yik at the World Badminton Championships 2022, as well as for winning the mixed team gold and men's doubles bronze at the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games in August. Aaron said he will give his best at the World 12 Finals in China in preparation for next year's qualifiers for the 2024 Paris Olympics. Oh, hey, that's a beautiful... Real Madrid beat Celtic 5-1 at home to finish top of their Champions League group early today as they bounced back from their first loss of the season against RB Leipzig last week. Goals from Luka Modric, Rodrigo, Marco Asensio, Vinicius Junior and Federico Valverde, the first two from the penalty spot, ensured the holders topped Group F with 13 points, one ahead of second place Leipzig with both teams reaching the round of 16. Five minutes into the match, Modric found Rodrigo with a beautiful touch and the Brazilian's angled shot thundered off the post. Valverde's strike from the rebound was deflected off the hand of a defender and Modric dispatched the spot kick after sending the goalkeeper the wrong way. Madrid were awarded another penalty after 18 minutes and following a VAR check, Rodrigo provided another calm finish. Asensio extended Real's lead six minutes after the break with a nice volley from a Dani Car Vagil cross and 10 minutes later, Valverde made a great run down the right and cross for Vinicius to score with a close-range shot. Valverde added the fifth with what is becoming his trademark and unstoppable long-range strike into the top corner. Jota scored a consolation goal for Celtic, slotting a free kick into the top right corner five minutes from time. Meanwhile, FC Copenhagen scored their first goal in this season's Champions League campaign as they drew 1-1 with already qualified Borussia Dortmund in their last Group G game. The Danes had been condemned to last place from the previous match day and, although the match lacked significance, the hosts got off to a strong start. Copenhagen put the Germans firmly on the back foot in the first half and had 12 shots on goal before they were rewarded with Hakan Haraldsson's 41st-minute equaliser. The Spanish side will drop into the Europa League. Over in Warsaw, Christopher Gunku scored one goal and set up another as RB Leipzig crushed Shakhtar Donetsk 4-0 to qualify for the Champions League last 16 in style, while the Ukrainians dropped down to the Europa League. Leipzig, who only needed a point to advance to the knockout stage, smashed three quick-fire second-half goals to secure second place in Group F behind Real Madrid and joined fellow Bundesliga clubs Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund and Ein Truck Frankfurt in the next round. Football's stubbornness to its dealing with head injuries is endangering the health of players. A British brain injury charity said on Wednesday. 
Hedway highlighted the inconsistencies in the treatment of such injuries, citing the cases of Tottenham's Sun Hyung Min and Liverpool's James Milner in Champions League matches on Tuesday. Luke Griggs, Headway's interim chief executive, said the assessment of players for potential concussion remained extremely challenging for medics. Multiple studies have shown a link between brain injuries and an increased risk of developing neurodegenerative disease, and that ex-professional athletes are at an increased risk of developing such conditions. According to Griggs, football's stubbornness to accept the clear evidence that has emerged in recent years can no longer be tolerated. The Professional Footballers Association on Monday called for trials of temporary concussion substitutes and urged European governing body UEFA to introduce permanent concussion substitutes to its competitions. South Korea forward Sun Hyung Min's World Cup participation could be in doubt after he underwent surgery on a facial fracture. Tottenham Hotspur said Sun, 30, suffered injury midway through the first half of Tottenham's Champions League tie at Olympique de Marseille following an area clash with Chancel member. He required lengthy treatment on the pitch before being substituted and walking unsteadily down the tunnel. The London club said following surgery, Sun will commence rehabilitation with its medical staff and fans will be updated further in due course. South Korea's hopes at the World Cup, which begins in less than three weeks, rest heavily on Sun, who has scored 35 goals in 104 appearances for his country. South Korea are in Group H with Portugal, Ghana and Uruguay. Meanwhile, Bukayo Saka could feature for Arsenal as early as tonight's Europa League clash with FC Zurich after Mikel Arteta allayed fears of a serious injury for the England winger. Saka limped off early in the Gunners' 5-0 win over Nottingham Forest on Sunday after taking a blow to his ankle. That sparked concern for Saka's World Cup chances with the tournament to kick off in Qatar in little over three weeks. However, Arteta said Saka Saka has returned to training and is available for selection as his side aimed to secure top spot in Europa League Group A and a place in the last 16. And that ends today's edition of Updates at Noon. Wrapping up with a reminder of our top story, Food Bank Siswa program benefits over 21,000 students nationwide. Tune in to News at 10, coming up at 10pm on RTM News Channel. Till then, I'm Renee Fong. Have a pleasant afternoon.